I'm trying to give you some different views with all of these videos that I'm making. So I'm sitting in the garden and it's um, uh, October in 2023. This looks like the last days of summer for us. Um, absolutely fantastic weather, but I can see that the sunlight is gradually moving across my face, so I'm dodging back and forth all the time. Okay, in this particular video, we're going to be exploring the, uh, um, the methods chapter of your dissertation. And especially for those of you doing this as the literature review version, then your chapter two is the methods chapter. Although this chapter is called Methods, it's much more than that. It includes your philosophical dimensions of your study as well. So it's more like epistemologies, ontologies, maybe ethics, and uh, your methodology and your methods. Okay, so lots of things to consider within this chapter. But depending on which type of study that you're doing, lots of the philosophical aspects of this, so epistemology, ontology, ethics, they might be... Um, might be playing a minor role in this chapter altogether. Say, for example, if you're doing a particular type of study that's focused on um, um, on the quantitative methodology, then you might find that the underlying epistemology for that is called positivism or post-positivism. Maybe even you're using some aspects of pragmatism. But in that case, it's going to be very brief that you're writing about the impact of positivism here. Whereas if you're looking at the study which is more qualitative in nature, then it might be that you're using a few different um, epistemologies to actually explore your studies. So it depends on what the topic area is, it, uh, the, the topic area is that you're exploring. Um, um, and the different lens that you're using, the different epistemologies to look at these. And of course, the way in which we look at particular phenomena in life also reveals the way in which we explore the individuals being focused upon. So their ontos, their being, and that means that we're explore, exploring their ontology as well. Um, so it's going to be really important that you actually explore um, the epistemology, or if it's more than one epistemologies, um, any impacts from ontologies on what you're studying. Studying, Maybe you have to consider ethics here, or you might be referring to, to ethics later on. So say, for example, if, if, you're, partic um, if you're particularly focusing on, uh, let me just say, young people and mental health. So you might say, well, I want to look at numbers. So I'm looking at uh, quantitative research to look at how many young people are diagnosed with a particular severe mental illness label. And that's what you want to do. So you want to be exploring the numbers and the relationship with the, the number of people diagnosed with this and the service provision that's afforded to them. But then when you start thinking about it, you might say, well, look, lots of young people don't like labels. Or some services may be really good with young children, but then there can be a gap for adolescents and teenagers. They may fall between the gap between young people's services and adult services. And in that case, even trying to explore numbers may not necessarily be accurate. So straight away, we've started looking at people uh, uh, differently. We're using different lenses. And also the ontos then, the being, um, that reflects in people who have got labels attached to them. So supposing you have a young person that's been diagnosed with bipolar condition and if that label is actually attached to the individual, but then you might be keen in exploring, well, how do young people feel about having labels attached to them, especially when they're mental health or mental illness labels? So all the stuff around stigma theory may be coming in or the fact that some young people may want to rebel against conforming to particular types of services. So all this reflects in what you're thinking about with your epistemology and then the ontos, the ontology. And then in a, in a way that can tap into ethics because how ethical is it to do studies um, on certain groups of people. So whether it's from your point of view, you're considering the ethics of a study, or more often than not with literature reviews, you might be mentioning the ethics 
that the studies you look at actually mention. Okay, so um, you do not need ethical approval to do a literature review. But of course, you have to follow ethical standards. You have to make sure that your review is robust and that you're not discriminating against people. So ethics do have a role to play um, in literature reviews. But more than that, it may be as you're doing literature reviews, you're noticing what the studies that you're looking at are actually talking about ethics. Okay, so that's how this chapter can be philosophical. As I say, it may be very brief. It may be just a paragraph or so that you're writing on epistemology and ontology, especially if you're doing this from a quantitative point of view. But if you're using mixed methods or qualitative research, then epistemologies and ontologies and ethics may play a much bigger role, not just in this chapter, but influencing the succeeding chapters as well. Okay, so think about this as epistemology, ontology, maybe ethics here, methodology and methods. That's the type of stuff you're going to be covering with this chapter. Now, it's really important for you to give us your rationale, which just means why. Why do you want to do it in the particular way you're doing it? So, um, with your uh, research methods module, and then once you started the dissertation module, you would have noticed that I'm emphasising on quite a few occasions that you really need to get to grips with... Um, uh, research methods about literature reviews. Don't just say, oh, I'm going to do a literature review and as a bachelor student I did it in a particular way, so I'm just going to do the same sort of review. That's no rationale, that's no reason why to do this. So when you explore some of the literature about different ways of doing literature reviews, then think of the topic you want to explore and consider which type of review may actually work best with the particular type of study that you want to do, okay? And that all forms part of your rationale, the reason why. So when you read some of the papers or some of the textbooks around different types of literature reviews, you explore the type of review that best suits your topic, and that's what you can give us as your rationale. But the rationale may also include um, why you've chosen this topic, um, why did you choose this one and didn't, uh, and in the way you want to do it, and not in a different way, for example? So that's really good about doing the rationale. So it's given you the opportunity to say why, why you've chosen this, why you're doing it the way in which you intend to do it, but also give us a clue of why you're not doing it other ways. So especially if you're reading some of the key texts on different types of literature reviews, you might say. Well, I've chosen to do it in this one particular way because, and then give us the reason why, but also explore at least one or two other different types of literature reviews and just give us a brief insight into, well, I could have done it in those particular ways as well, but I've decided not to because of, and then give us the reasons why. And that, again, is going to consolidate your learning around different types of literature reviews and especially showing how you're gaining a mastery of understanding different types of methods. OK, so that's going to be really, really important. Again, when you refer to the different types of liter literature reviews, of course, get references in there. More references are always better. So if you say, for example, that, well, this review that I'm doing is going to be called a rapid review. So where did you get that term from? Put in a reference for a rapid review. Then you might say, uh, you might use a different reference to say, some particular people describe a rapid review in this particular way. So give another reference. Or then you may actually read a few different types of uh, rapid reviews and you might even put those references in as well. So more references are always better. Okay? The epistemology might also influence which type of review you're doing as well. So if you're going to be asking more qualitative 
uh, questions of the, the work that you're studying, obviously that shows that you need to get to, to um, um, a good understanding of the epistemological ways of looking at this. So let me give you an example that I might have used in class. Say we talk about domestic violence and abuse. Supposing you say, well, look, I'm really interested in understanding about domestic violence and abuse. So what is it? What aspect of it are you interested in? So even if you did a mind map diagram that you use as an appendix in your work, explore domestic violence and abuse and then mind map all the things that come to mind to you about this. So say, for example, if you say, well, look, more often than not, it tends to be women who are the victims of domestic violence and abuse. But then you realise what you're interested in is this whole notion of victim. So lots of work has been written on the whole topic of, uh, of what's called victimology. What does it mean to be a victim? What does it mean to be labelled as a victim or stereotyped as a victim? And then you realise that other people are writing more about this and saying, well, look, it's not just a victim status, but look how some victims say that they've survived through this. So they may be talking about survivors and others go on and talk even more and say that they're thriving through it. I'm sure I've used this example with you before, but that means that you're looking at one particular topic domestic violence and abuse, but the lens that you're using to look at this may be around victimology. It may be on how people can move from victim status to survivor through to thriver. Or you might say, well, actually, because domestic violence and abuse often happens within family settings, the view I want to look at is the impact on children who are witnesses. And then you might say, well, when I'm reading work around this, sometimes there are gender differences. M male children who view this may grow up and see this very differently to females who view it. So this is where the epistemology is coming in. You're starting to look at this in so many different ways, um, depending on what the topic is that you're looking at. So it's going to be really important for you to mention this. Once you know what your topic is and the epistemological way you're looking at it, then you'll realise which is going to be the best methodology or genre for using, which research genre you going to use. Are you going to use quantitative approaches, qualitative, or are you going to do mixed methods? So that means now you've explored your, your philosophical dimensions, you're now choosing your methodology, so quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods. And whichever one you decide on, then you need to ask yourself, so which tools or which methods does this particular methodology um, um, use? So when it comes to doing literature reviews, again, go back to your rationale for why you're choosing a particular type and get to really understand that type well. And that once you do that, you'll then be able to decide which type of search and how you're going to do the search. So um, I've already explored this in a previous Adobe Express resource with you on doing your inclusion and exclusion criteria. So that's going to be important. E and even when you're choosing the different databases. So if you say, well, I only want to do my study focusing on primary research and it's in health studies, or maybe health, and you want to explore gender as well. So you're going to limit yourself to which databases you're looking at. If you say, well, no, actually, I want to look at media representations. So how the television media or how the um, print media refer to certain people, then you might be using totally different databases to access different types of resources. So it's going to be important when you're talking about the methods that you're using. And again, depending on which type of review you're doing, there may be more critical and analytical tools that will be expected of certain types of reviews that may not be so expected of others. So for example, when you talk about things like a Prisma chart, showing how you um, originally found a particular number of studies and how you're whittling that number down to a manageable level. And you may be displaying this through a Prisma chart or something similar. So that's certainly expected in 
scientific approaches to literature reviewing. So presumably most of you are going to be using this, most if not all. Then some literature reviews also you re require you to use a matrix table, which you can put in as an appendix. And in that table, as I've said in one of the earlier videos, in that table you may be looking out for uh, number of participants in studies, the type of study, um, the strengths and weaknesses about them. Or you may be using, if you're looking at um, uh, themes within studies, if it's a more qualitative approach, say for example if you're using a thematic analysis, then you'll be using key names like um, Brown and Clark on thematic analysis. So you'll be following their particular methods of how you actually code individual themes, how you identify them, how you code them, and then how you group them together into overview of themes. So all these different types of methods um, you need to understand for the particular type of review that you're doing. It's also important that the, the methodology that you choose and the methods that you choose enable you to fulfill your study, especially from the point of view of looking back to when you wrote about your aim for the study and what you hope to achieve, your outcomes. So um, for many of you, you might be designing a research question. And if you are doing a research question, that will also fit into your aim and outcomes. So all, the, all of these things need to dovetail together so that what you want to do with your whole dissertation, your aim for what you want to achieve and how you show that you've achieved it will also relate to your research question. And for many of you, remember, especially at master's level, you might only want to have one central research question, one main question that you're trying to answer by using the various studies that you're looking at. And um, sometimes you need to break this question down into smaller subsidiary questions. That's fine, because some of the works you look at will be answering one bit of your question and maybe not others. So you might have one overall question that you can then break down into a few of the others. And basically, that's it with your chapter two. So make sure you have a look at the, the guidelines in the handbook that explain exactly what you need to do for your dissertation and then look at the assignment specification that I've produced for you. And that gives you a clue of how many words per chapter and even which subheadings you may be using throughout. So by focusing on what I've said in this video, and putting that into practice, especially with the written documentation that you've got supporting this, and obviously discussing this with your supervisors. So presumably many supervisors will be asking you to submit chapter by chapter, so that when you've done your chapter two, which is, is it maybe about 1500 words, and obviously it's going to be quite descriptive, this one, because you're talking about the methods of actually what you've done. Yeah, or how you're going to operationalize this work. So this is quite a descriptive chapter, but once you've got the work to analyze, that comes in your next chapter, which I'll be explaining on another Adobe resource. Okay, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.